Good morning, good day, good evening, good overnight, whenever you happen to be listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. The world is sleep. That's what we're going to be talking about this evening as the light ever so gently fades. The world is most certainly asleep. The sheep have nestled down they've been corralled and so many people out there have no clue of what is really going on they believe the media no matter how much the media is proven to be liars they believe stars rock stars pop stars they believe actors and actresses They are pushed by people telling them to do the right thing. Oh, go out and do the right thing. When these people are some of the biggest, most misled people in the world who always seem to do the wrong thing. And now they presume to tell us what the right thing is. They act as if they have some kind of knowledge of uh, medical understanding or political understanding. I mean, look at who they vote for and who they support. It's a pretty telling thing. What if you knew that 90% of everything that you see on TV or in movies or from the media or from streaming media sites or what you read in the newspapers or magazines or what you see on your favorite social media sites were all lies or at the very least things twisted into something they never actually were and what if you then decided that you'd had enough of it and voiced the truth or even spoke your opinion your mind and spoke contrary to what is being presented as the official narrative about these things and then you were censored from being heard or fact checked by as many as four or five different opinions from some social network which are at best skewed or at worst outright lies what if you were threatened with being banned if you dared to have an opinion contrary to what the popular narrative is of the day would you still believe you were free would you say that you had freedom of speech would you say that you had the right to speak your mind or to abstain from certain things which are becoming ever more the social norms that all the masses of brute beasts do Speaking of beasts, would you not liken that way of life to a beast system? Wouldn't you say, who can overcome such a system of rich and powerful and influential people? Who have every mouthpiece out there and only their voices are heard. And any dissenting opinion is squelched. Would you not then say who is able to make war with the beast? Well, the beast is not here just yet. However, they are laboring on it just the same. Again, the walls of Babylon are going up. What if you knew there was more to the story than what you're being told by the officials and by the so-called representatives of truth and liberty? 
What if you're aware that the richest and most influential entrepreneurs and successful business people, or you knew that there were others who hid in the shadows, were in complete control over you, over your destiny, and you lived under the delusion that you were still somehow free. That is an illusion. There are such who control the world. They control the world leaders. They control the flow of money. They control the stock markets. They control the people of famous name. As easily as a puppet is controlled while hanging on his strings. But let's pull it all this together and say, what if all this was real? What, what would it be? Well, then you would be where we are today, living in 2021 on the planet Earth, in what is beginning to be more than an Orwellian nightmare. Many of you can see the distractions being used to hide the truth. Many of you can see our oldest nemesis being blamed for everything. In other words, China being blamed for the modern sickness, Russia for the fraudulent election, and known terrorist Islamic groups for the instability in nations that our troops once liberated and then pulled out of. I mean, what did they think was going to happen? I'm not talking about our troops. What did the leaders who pulled them out think was going to happen? Did they think the Taliban was not going to rush in there and take the place back over again? These people, after all, are fanatics. You know, there's a lot of things going on now that people are not seeing, and, and these things are being used as a distraction. In other words, this whole thing in Afghanistan right now is being used as a distraction to keep your eyes off your home soil. The cost of oil is being blamed on the oil producing nations. In other words, the price of gas and everything being blamed on the oil producing nations. That is to say the Arabic nations where we buy most of our stuff even though we have our own oil. But we're not allowed to have our own oil because of environmental concerns. You know, they've stopped that dead. There's enough oil in this nation and in Canada and, and other places that, that are territories held by the United States where we don't need oil from other people. But then again, if we stopped buying oil from them, we wouldn't be part of a big, happy, global family, would we? And then on the political, you've got racism, which, which has long been over with in this country. Uh, I shouldn't say that racism has been done away with. There will always be some racists of every race. But racism is blamed for the underachievers of the world who cry foul and whine and perpetually can be used to pander to for voting basis. This is why they keep electing the same people over and over and over. The same people who keep making the worst decisions and the stupidest things they do are being elected over and over and over again. How does that happen? It's an agenda. Religion is being blamed because people reject faith and or religion for the sometimes sensible sounding nonsense of atheistic science. In other words, science is a wonderful thing. It has moved us forward in time and technology. I don't really mean time as in time travel, but it's brought us up. It's given us modern conveniences. Science has done wonderful things. And science can do wonderful things until it becomes completely atheistic. And then we're given another false narrative of how we came to be. The Big Bang and evolution. 
And then we move on to the big one that's going on right now. The modern sickness in the world. The Big 19. Blaming it for a terribly troubled economy and a failing stock market. When, you know, those of you who have been watching the stock market know that the stock market had been hyperinflated. There are many experts out there that when the stock market was at its highest zenith, were wondering how in the world the stock market was up that high. Because our GDP was not that much. The gold standard, the silver standard, all of these things that are traded were not trading as well, but the stock market was way, way, way up. Only now, the hyperinflated bubble is beginning to collapse. You know, we have so much idiocracy in this country. You, you can't even go to a McDonald's or, or a Wendy's or a Walmart or, or, or any store now, in, in some cases, not every case, but in some cases, and use uh, cash. They want you to use a card only. And they tell you that there's not enough loose change. We don't have enough loose change. I pulled up at a drive-thru, made an order, paid with cash. The lady says, do you want your change back? And I said, uh, yeah, it is mine. That's happened on like three or four occasions now. We're being told that there's not a new loose change in the world anymore. When they have been making coins in this nation and around the world since ancient times, and in our nation since its very birth. As it stands right now, there is more loose change in circulation in this nation and around the world than there has ever before been at any time. Yet somehow the banks can't get enough of it. Or they aren't allowed to give out but very little and then only to restaurants or stores or you know, you, you can't walk in now to most places and get uh, uh, more than a roll or two rolls of coins or something like that. So what does that tell you? Well, it means that there is an agenda at work. It means it is a lie. People have not hoarded up all the change in the world. People have to eat. And in order to eat or to go out and buy groceries or to spend, uh, go out and spend... They have to have plenty of change. But those in power are controlling the flow of money. And oh, how they love to control money. You know, they're already claiming that dollar bills, no matter what denominations they are, are spreading this sickness that's going around. Pretty soon they're going to demand that there be no more greenback paper dollar notes even their own Federal Reserve notes. Then they can control your money even more. They and the brainwashed youth of this country rebel and rail against capitalism. Capitalism! The most successful system ever created when it comes to earning money and spending money and keeping what you earn blamed by socialists and communists and idiots for the inequality between the classes you don't think that's by design now at first there was this sickness the big 19 the spurious sickness upon the world, which they hyperinflated it the same way that they hyperinflated the stock market. They falsely reported deaths. They blamed deaths on things that were not caused by it. But now, after so many people have been running out and getting their little jabs because they're afraid and they're trying to protect themselves, much as was, was suspected, those who have gone out and gotten their little jabs have become shedders of the virus and spreaders of that which was never that deadly in the first place. 
In other words, that which was supposedly created to combat the current sickness in the world becomes the very thing that is now making people sick who had never been ill at all. I have probably three to four friends now who are actually sick, who made it all the way through 2019, late, and through 2020, and most of 2021. Only now, because people that they work with, or people that they go out and shop with, have been jabbed, they're now ill, and it's not just the illness itself, now they have pneumonia, all of them. Do you not think that this has all been engineered to happen this way? It is a method for those in power to take more control over the affairs of the government and over your daily life and to constrict your freedoms and your liberties. It is false. And this remedy is not the cure. This thing would have probably died out on its own eventually, or at least gone dormant again. But not now. In times past, people did use such methods to make their bodily system stronger in order, off to in order to ward off sickness. But now, seemingly, it's been turned into a weapon so that they can make this second big siege or third siege, whatever you want to call it, spread even faster and harder. And I am again speaking of the Big 19 and its engineered offspring progeny. You know, I saw a map recently of the United States around July 5th. And it was showing a vast retreat in the current illness. But now, uh, as of this week, all of a sudden the map is 90% covered in glowing red again, meaning infection. This is an agenda. It is a narrative. It's almost like a zombie apocalypse movie, only instead of being sci-fi fantasy, the real threat is coming from the bunch of typhoid Marys out there who went and got jabbed because they fell for the narrative and now they're spreading the sickness. They're shedding it. You know, the same thing happened during the uh, Spanish flu outbreak. I believe it was in the early 1900s, around 1917 to 1920. And 50 million people died. At least that's the official number. And the people that are going out and getting jabbed now are doing it to protect themselves. But they're also sheep that are being corralled. The trap has been sprung and they fell for it. All eyes are closed and many lies and liars abound. The truth has fallen and deception is at the current high water mark, but it's only an exercise for the bigger deception and flood of lies that is yet to come. And because of all of this, there is division everywhere and confusion about everything. People will not stand together. People are taken in by political parties and political leaders. And the sheep are being led astray. Again, the trap has worked and they fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. The Kenites are way more cunning than we give them credit for. Well, I shouldn't say we because I know how cunning they are. Their father is in control of them. And you can better believe there is much more to come to crush under the faithful, the honest, and the informed, and to make them out to look stupid and conspiracy-oriented. And it's being done by those who are in control by use of the blinded who cannot see and are sheep being corralled by fear 
or by shame to go out and get their little pinpricks. The spirit of delusion is here. And it's not slowing its march. The liars are emboldened. And they never cease to spew their toxic and illogical venom. Now what if you knew all this and you knew that everything that you could do or say did not matter because they must win. Why? Because it's in our Father's plan. Our nation has turned its back on our Father and we are suffering the consequences of it. You know, I've said for a long time that we have certain rights that we can stand up. We cannot stop global government. We cannot stop the coming of the Antichrist. But how we live and how we stand up and fight for our freedoms, yes, that we can control. But people are too disoriented by lies. Still listening to the media. Still believing what they see in movies. There's a day coming for those who do evil and who love evil and choose darkness over the light when they're going to stand in the judgment of God Almighty. I guess that's about enough said. There's really not much more I can say about it. People are going to be deceived and it's already beginning. I mean, if they can't see past what is being done now, then they're certainly going to be trapped when the big delusion comes. That said, <coughs> we're going to go and begin a Bible study here. We're going to begin in the book of Psalms, chapter 58. Been using a lot of David lately. David learned a lot in his lifetime. He saw the error of his ways, and he loathed and despised iniquity. As we covered in the last Bible study, he absolutely hated the evil, and he hated how they prospered. And they sure are prospering, because they are the richest and the most powerful on the earth. So again, we're going to start in Psalms 58, and before we begin this Bible study, let us go before our Father's throne. Let us ask our Father for guidance as we study this His most holy word. So brothers and sisters, let us pray and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy most holy name, O Heavenly Father. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done, Father. As surely as you have told us it shall. We ask this day, Father, that you give us greater understanding of this, your most holy word. We ask that you open eyes and ears and hearts and minds, Father, to be able to receive these truths. I ask, Father, that you give this mouth the spirit to speak with of truth without mistake without misspeak, without misleading anyone. And also, Father, we ask that these listening will go and check these things out for themselves so that they may know of a surety the real truth and have dug for it because it is as a precious treasure. And we ask these things of you, Father, in the name of our Lord, our Savior, our Intercessor, Jesus Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach. Amen and Amen. Now, prayer being asked, we're going to be starting again in Psalm 58, a Psalm of David. These Psalms written in the later years of David's life. David had his own shortcomings, naturally, as we all do. We all fall short of the glory of God. He had much to say. And it resonates even to this time. Psalms chapter 58 and verse 1 and it reads. 
Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? In other words, this is two questions here. Are you speaking rightness, O congregation? That is to say, those that are supposed to be worshiping God, Almighty, Omnipotent, or in our case, Christ, which is God? Do you judge uprightly? In other words, do you judge fairly, ye sons of men, you, you flesh men? Verse 2. Yea, in heart, that is to say in your mind, you work wickedness. You weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. In other words, your hands are heavy with violence. Verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Now naturally we know that children do not do this the moment they are born. This is just an analogy. It's a frustration on the part of David. Letting you know this. In other words, what he's trying to say here is, it's as, as soon as they're born, they go about speaking lies. You know, most people that come through this earth age uh, are probably, especially now, part of that generation of those that rebelled against God. And as we know, children do speak lies. I mean, there, there are some very cute videos on YouTube and, and other places that you can watch where a child will be caught in the act of doing something. You know, painting a wall or getting into their mom's makeup or any of a hundred other things that they shouldn't have been doing, getting into cookies. And they're caught red-handed and their mother will say, <coughs> did you do this? And they'll say, no. <laughs> now naturally we're not just talking about children here. I mean, I, that's just an example. David is just showing his frustration. Uh, in other words, as soon as they're born into this flesh, they go around speaking lies. And they do. Many of them never grow out of it. Verse 4. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. Now we all know who the serpent is in the Bible, and so did David. Guarantee you, David understood what the serpent connotation was from the book of Genesis. They are like a deaf adder that stoppeth her ear. In other words, an adder is a serpent. And why is it used here in the feminine, stoppeth her ear? Well, mystery Babylon. In other words, they will not hear the truth. They will not allow the truth. They will censor the truth. A generation of vipers, they are. Verse 5. Which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming ever so wisely. I mean, I know many of you have probably seen some of the Indian people charming a snake with a pipe and... Uh, not necessarily controlling them, but they don't seem to get bitten by the cobras that they cause to rise up out of the baskets. And other people do the same. I mean, you can watch a lot of the animal shows where people deal with snakes, very poisonous snakes. But what this really comes down to is these people, these liars, will not listen to the voice of charmers, which is to say the voice of reason or, or the voice of wisdom even when they charm ever so wisely. In other words, no matter how wisely or how intelligently they speak. Many of you can understand this because when you plant seeds, people will either quickly change the subject or they will quickly uh, dismiss what you're saying or forget it. Or they'll argue with you. Verse 6. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. In other words, what good is a snake without teeth? It can't even take a prey. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. In other words, the young lions are those that are spry enough to go out and they are the hunters. The older lions will most often feed off the uh, leftovers. In other words, they're opportunists, scavengers. So what's David saying here? Break their teeth. Make them where they cannot do harm. Verse 7. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be cut in pieces. And naturally, he's talking about uh, God or wisdom here, either one. 
In other words, God is not actually going to, even where you read many places in the time that he spins his arrows, he's not actually going to shoot arrows at people and cut them down. This is an analogy. In other words, let them be cut to pieces. Let God's wrath fall upon them. Verse 8. As a snail which melteth, let every one of them pass away like the untimely birth of a woman. In other words, as a stillborn child. That they may not see the sun. In other words, you can sense David's hatred here for those that speak lies and iniquity. And do iniquity. Verse 9. Before your pots can fill the thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Now this may be a little bit hard to understand for some unless you go and look up the words. Um, the word pots here is as a hanging pot. And the thorns here are things that spring up quickly. And you can get this analogy even with the word pots. In other words, when you cook over a fire, um, and let's say the pot's been hanging out there for a day or two, and all of a sudden these thorns have, have uh, grown up and they've reached the pot. And what happens if thorns get into your food when you're cooking it? Well, guess what? That's not going to feel very good on your mouth. Thorns, as you know, thistles and briars, are all used as a symbology for Kenites in the Bible. So what's he saying here? Before your pots can can before the thorns can reach your pots would be better translation. He shall take them away as with the whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Now, the living, of course, in the flesh and in his wrath to do away with them uh, in the eternity. Verse ten. The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance, and he shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Now, naturally, nobody wants to wash their feet in the blood of anyone, even if they are wicked. What this simply means is, let the wicked, since they be so many in number, fall, and let their blood stain the ground, and let the righteous walk over them, that their feet be stained as the blood of the wicked. Verse 11. So that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judges in the earth. In other words, a confirmation. Verily, there is a reward for those that do right. And truly, there is a God that judges the earth. In other words, David's longing for that day. Longing for the day of judgment. Let us continue now. We're going to go to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. Now you may ask yourself, what has this got to do with the world being asleep? Well, the world is asleep because of the wicked. Either directly where they have shed blood or indirectly because of the laws that they have drafted and the things that they are doing, people kill each other. Because there is no penalty anymore. I mean, murder is legal now in the form of abortion. And nobody thinks a thing about it much unless they're Christians and unless they're standing on a fairly righteous foundation. Even if they're mistaken about other things like the rapture, they certainly know that shedding blood is wrong. In other words, the world is being misled, which is the subject of this Bible study. The world asleep. So Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 1. I will stand my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved or reproved, that is to say. That is to say questioned or, uh, you know, whenever God speaks to you, it, it's, it's always correction either for you or for someone else. But you could also say tested, you know. What will I answer when I am tested? Are you keeping the watch? Are you upon the tower? Are you waiting on the true husband? Verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, 
and make it plain upon tables, that is to say, tablets, that he may run that readeth it. In other words, put it on tablets and send it out and let it spread from place to place. Let the tablets be handed around. In other words, what are we talking about? The same thing that we do when we study our Father's Word. It goes from ear to ear to ear, and eventually it spreads. Verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now some may say, that sounds like a contradiction. It's a vision for the appointed time. What is the appointed time? The, the, the final days. But at the end it shall speak. In other words, at the end it shall be understood. And not lie. You'll, you'll know it's true. Though it tarry, that is to say for now, wait for it. Because it will surely come. And when it begins to come, it will not tarry. Verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. In other words, it's risen up in self-pride. But the just shall live by his faith. Now, are we talking about Satan here or are we talking about the worldly? Well, actually both. I mean, it, it doesn't matter whether you're Satan who, you know, we read in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28 and see that Satan's problem with God was that he rose up in pride. He thought he was something else. He wanted to be God. And there are a lot of people in this world that believe that through witchcraft or the attainment of wealth and the attainment of talismans or spells or things that they too eventually can rise to some kind of higher power. This is one reason why people worship Lucifer or Wicca or even worship Satan himself and, and live by the saying, do as thou wilt. In other words, they know that the flesh is short-lived, but they want to make the best of it. I mean, who doesn't want to make the best of their life, right? But these take advantage of it. They waste their life worshiping things that are false. But what's the last line of this verse say, verse 4? But the just shall live by his faith. In other words, that's what sustains us. Verse 5. Ye also, because he transgresses by wine, that is to say he's a drunkard, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and as, is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth upon him all people. Now, you know, that's like reading the book of Revelation right there. It's like reading Mark 13, Matthew 24, Luke 21. Yea, also, because he transgresses by wine, that is to say, the wine of fornication, which is what seduces mystery Babylon, he's a proud man. Satan, of course, is male of gender. Neither keepeth at home. In other words, he doesn't keep it. He's not satisfied with what he has within his house. Satan wasn't satisfied with his treasures. Who enlarges his desire as hell. There's two connotations could be used for this. Hell is always enlarging itself because of sin. But this one doesn't care about that. He, he enlarges his desire. Which one are we talking about? Satan. And is as death. Hebrews chapter 2, 14. Who is it that has the power of death? And cannot be satisfied. But gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. In other words, he wants everybody to worship him. And he gathers them all together in a one world government, which is brought about by his children. Verse 6. Shall not all these things take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his? In other words, what is not Satan's? Well, life is not Satan's. Satan didn't create life. 
The souls of man Satan didn't create. Man in the flesh Satan did not create. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay, that is to say miry clay. In other words, deceiving the flesh. And you could also look at this as there, there are many people in the flesh that are right after Satan's own heart. They laid it themselves with thick clay. In other words, they, 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 they're getting big and thick with their wealth. Verse 7. Shall not they rise up suddenly that shall bite thee? And awake that shall vex thee? For thou shalt be booties unto them. Now, shall they not rise up suddenly? That means immediately. That bite thee. Okay, where do we hear about things biting you or stinging you in the Bible. Let's see. Well, we could say uh, in the writings of Moses, but how about Satan's locust army? Revelation chapter 9. When they awake, they vex thee. It doesn't mean they're sleeping when they're hidden away. Thou shalt be for booties unto them. You know what a booty is? That's a treasure. I mean, they're, they're going to take everything in your house. They're going to take your house. Now, I'm not saying they're going to repo. They're going to steal the souls of your household. Christ said, Think not that I am come to bring peace in the world. I am come to bring a sword. In other words, he came to cause a controversy. That the father be set against the son, the mother against the daughter, and the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and so on and so forth. A man's foes shall be those of his own household. You know, I said something offensive to a member of my family the other day about these uh, these little pinprick jabs, and I got hung up on. Many times when I've tried to teach members of my family about the rapture and stuff, they have, as I said before, quickly changed the subject or flat out argued. And that's probably pretty prevalent amongst those who try to teach their family members. Let's get back to this. Verse 8. Verse eight. Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, and of the city, and of all that dwell therein. You know what city we're talking about by any chance here? Well, you could say Mystery Babylon, that grand city. Jerusalem. That's where Mystery Babylon will be the focal point of. Why? Because Satan has spoiled many nations. And for that, all the remnant of the people, that remnant that God said that he would leave, the election, are going to spoil him. Because of men's blood, that is to say murder in the earth and for the violence of the land. Now, you know, uh, someone could do violence with their mouth. Speaking lies. It doesn't have to be natural violence. Someone asked me the other day, uh, what do you think the uh, war in heaven was like? Or in the first earth age? I don't really think it was fought with sword or with spear or with bows and arrows or anything like that. I believe it was a controversy of words. Some stood on one side, some stood on the other. Some stood with God, that is to say, some stood with Satan. And probably some were on the fence. And coming through this age, they're still on the fence. Pretty much what you were in the first earth age, you are here. If you're elect, it's because God chose you and knew you before. You know, just as is written of Jacob and also Esau. Esau was hated of God even before he was born. Why? No doubt he rebelled against God in the earth age it was. We all know what Esau's uh, children, his remnant became. They became an atheistic nation. That doesn't mean that every single one of his children is spoiled or that every single progeny of Esau is evil. They're not. Russia was a very Christian nation for many, many, many years before it turned to communism in 1917. And now we have the same thing happening in America. Verse 9. Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetous to his house. What is an evil covetous? That's, that's anything that's against God. That, that doesn't matter whether you steal or, or, or whether you do perversity 
or, or whether you do anything. You, even your, you could even say house here is church. It's, it's pro, no doubt the word Beth. But woe unto him that coveteth an evil thing to his house. Uh, that, that's even your house of worship. What did you bring in the rapture doctrine there? That he may set his nest on high. In other words, for gain. And he may be delivered from the power of evil. In other words, he thinks he's going to be delivered from the power of evil. He believes his wealth and or his stature or his earthly things can save him or his false gods. Let me put it that way to, to make it the clearest. <clears throat> A lot of people think false doctrines are going to save them. The easy way out. Verse 10. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and to sin against thy soul. In other words, you've sinned against your own soul. You're, you're putting your soul in peril. Your soul is being made mortal, which is to say liable to die. It's going to be cut off. Verse 11. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam of timber shall answer it. Verse 12. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, that is to say with murder, and establish a city by iniquity. That is to say sin. Now, I want you to think back to all the times that God addressed Jerusalem and said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you to me as a chin gathered her hicks, her chicks, rather. I don't know why I said hicks. Maybe because I am one. <laughs> Who knows? Jerusalem was established in murder. Even Jebus, the town it was before it was Jerusalem, was established by murder. They didn't live by the law of God. And the Kenites surely did murder. They murdered the prophets. And they murdered Christ. And they murdered many saints. And in the end times, they're establishing a city by iniquity. The city of mystery Babylon. Again, at Jerusalem. We're talking about Babylon. We're talking about the place right now that does not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There are Christians there. There are Messianic Jews there that believe in the Messiah. However, there are many that are still waiting for the Messiah because they think he's going to be something vastly different than what Christ was, and therefore they miss the point. And they disallow certain verses, even of their own Torah and the Tanakh, to even be spoken. Verse 13, Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts, that is to say, it is not God's will that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity, which is to say emptiness. In other words, that's, that's not God's will. It's not God's will that anybody labor in strange fire or that they use a fire to build a false god or that they pass through the fire to get to salvation in the practice of Moloch and that they weary themselves for very vanity which is to say emptiness and so much of this world is about vanity right now. It's all about what the world can do for you. It's all about an entitlement. It's all about the wealth. It's all about possessions. It's all about fame and fortune. Or it's all about power. And many labor themselves in empty doctrines of men which make void the word of God. Verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, we know that that's future to us. Verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. In other words, warning to those that make their friends drunk. How, how can you make your friend drunk? Well, you know, when the Antichrist arrives here, people are going to say, that's him, that's him. And it, they're probably not going to have to convince their neighbors too hard, but there are 
preachers right now standing at the pulpit, pastors, priests, that are giving their congregations wine to drink. Not to take communion with, but rather the wine of fornication, to make them drunk, that they may look upon their nakedness. That is to say, that, so that they're going to be ashamed at the day of the return of Christ, as Adam and Eve were ashamed when God saw them in the garden. Verse 16. Thou art filled with the shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. That is to say, show that you're uncircumcised. Okay? And naturally, we're not talking about the uh, sexual organ of a man here. It's given as an example, but it's a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. In other words, these are of uncircumcised minds. They don't understand God's word. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. In other words, the cup of God's mighty right hand is going to pour out his wrath upon them because they poured out an unclean cup and caused their brothers to be drunken. And there's going to be a shameful spewing on their glory. Not going to be clean and white. Verse 17. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and for the violence of the land and the city and all that dwell therein. Again, Mystery Babylon, but you know, I like the first part of this. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid. I wonder what beasts could make people afraid nowadays. Well, a beast system, a beast system that corrals sheep into going out and getting jabbed. Tells them it's the right thing to do, that they ought to be ashamed if they don't. And because of men's blood, and for the violence in the land. Men's blood being shed, who, who did Christ tell us were responsible for shedding the blood of all the righteous on the earth? It was a generation, or a genia. In other words, it was a seed line, a bloodline, the sons of Cain. Verse 18. What profit the graven image that the maker thereof has graven it? In other words, what good did it do for a man to make his own God? That's what a graven image is. The molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusted therein to make dumb idols. Now, you have to understand this or you're going to miss the point. Naturally, the first part is easy. What profit does it give a man to make his own God and then to fall and worship it? And the molten image, in other words, they cover it over with heated metal and surround it. And the teacher of lies, in other words, first of all, it's a dumb idol. It can't even speak. So who is the real teacher of lies? Well, the one that fashioned it that the maker of his work trusted therein to make dumb idols. In other words, they make their own gods, and many people today make their own doctrines that will lead to a false god. That's the example being given here. In other words, how stupid can you be to make your own god and fall and worship it? How stupid can you be to make up your own doctrines? or be taken in by the doctrines of those who made up their own doctrines. Verse 19. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake! And to the dumb stone, Arise! It shall teach! Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. In other words, it's not even alive! So let's reread this again with understanding. Warning unto him that tells a piece of wood, Awaken and become my God. 
or to a dumb stone. Arise and lead us and teach us. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver. It's, it's a rock or a piece of wood covered with gold and silver metal. And there's no breath at all in the midst of it. It's not alive. Verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. You know, at the returning of our Lord, the world will keep silence. They're going to be on bended knee. And he shall speak. And then shall they cheer. That is to say, those that were not taken in. Let us go to Isaiah chapter 56 now. Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 1, and it reads, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment, that is to say righteous judgment, and do justice. Look at the world around you now. Do you think that's happening? For my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. When's it going to be revealed? After the unrighteousness of the Antichrist. Verse 2. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, and keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it. You know what our Sabbath, our rest is? It's Christ. And keepeth his hand from doing any evil. You know, it is so hard in today's world not to do some little sin, some little evil, some little temptation at all times. And we all fall short again. But we don't do evil. We may sin. We may give in to the flesh once in a while. We may do something we shouldn't do. But we don't have evil in our hearts. Of course, you could say that doing something, even for the moment, is a form of evil in your heart. But that's why we have an intercessor and why we have to pray so often and, and make repentance before the Lord. Verse 3. Neither let the son of a stranger that hath joined himself unto the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. In other words, you're given two things here. Um, naturally, a eunuch uh, cannot bring forth children. So he says, Behold, I'm a dry tree. In other words, I'm worthless. I can't bring forth any progeny. But what does God say? Neither let the son of a stranger that had joined himself to the Lord. There's a qualifier there. Speak saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. In other words, I'm not worthy to be in the congregation of the Lord because I'm a stranger. I'm not of Israel, in other words. Because we are reading from the book of Isaiah here. You know, the world is full of Gentiles. And at one time the Gentiles were not allowed in. But now they are. Because Christ came and paid the price and the temple, of, the veil of the temple was rent. Open to anyone who will. John 3.16 In other words, God's saying, don't let the son of a stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak and say, the Lord has separated me from his people. It's not a true statement. Neither let the eunuch say I'm a dry tree. Verse 4 For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs, that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Verse 5. Even unto them I will give mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. In other words, they're going to have a name better than the sons and daughters. Who are the sons and daughters? That's the children of Israel, the chosen. Well, why would God give a eunuch or a Gentile that? Well, because they had an even harder time overcoming in this earth age. God's children Israel were chosen because God knew who they were. And even most of them failed him. But the Gentile that is overcome, yes, they're going to have a very special place. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place. In other words, they're going to be joint heirs with all other Christians. That is to say, who have not been deceived. 
verse 6. Also to the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, verse 7, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. You know, this is what Christ told the, the, uh, the Kenites, who were, in fact, Gentiles. I mean, they claim to be of the seed of Abraham. And, of course, they can claim it, because everyone thinks they're Israel. But even them will I bring to my holy mountain, that's Mount Zion, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. That is God's temple. And their burnt sacrifices and offerings shall be accepted upon mine altar. Now, naturally, we don't do that anymore. So this is a figure of speech. It was historical to the time of this writing in Isaiah. In other words, God even making provision for the Gentile way back then before Christ. They joined themselves to the Lord. Think God doesn't know the heart? For mine house shall be called a prayer for all people. Now, did that say for Israel? No, that said for all people. I get a lot of people continuously trying to tell me that salvation is only for Israel. That's why things are written in the book of Revelation the way they are. In so they show their complete blissful ignorance. Colossal ignorance. The scriptures say the truth. Verse 8. The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, I will, yet will I gather others to him, besides those that are gathered unto him. In other words, what are we talking about here? Gentiles. Verse 9. All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all the beasts in the forests. Verse 10. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, and loving to slumber. You know, my girlfriend has two dogs that bark at every damn thing that moves in the yard. I don't care if it's a lizard on the screen, or a wasp flying by, or a car, or people walking down the street, or a grasshopper. They're going to bark. And while it does upset me at times that they bark so much, you can better be sure of one thing. They're doing it because they think they're protecting the house. But what is God saying of his watchmen here? His watchmen, his priests, his pastors are blind. They're all ignorant. They don't understand the word of God. They're all dumb dogs which cannot bark. In other words, they are not sounding the warning they love to slumber. They're loving to slumber. In other words, they're asleep. Asleep at the wheel. In other words, the beasts of the field and the beasts of the forest are coming and they're coming to devour. And the watchmen are blind. They're not warning people. They're all ignorant. They, they, they don't know what's going on. They're all dumb dogs which cannot bark. In other words, they're not warning of the beasts that are coming. There's two beasts mentioned here. Ever read of the two beasts of the book of Revelation? Chapter 12, chapter 13, verse 11. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. Oh, they love the money. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Every one for his gain from his quarter. In other words, they're doing it for money. They don't care. They're not concerned about God. They're doing it for the money. It's all about prosperity. You know, Jesus likes you to be prosperous. And I just feel so good looking out in my football stadium-sized church and telling everybody all these things. Verse 12. Come ye, they say. I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. In other words, the wine of fornication. And tomorrow... 
shall be as this day, and much more abundant. In other words, let's all go to the church and get drunk. Come on in. Let's all drink that strong drink, that is to say that false doctrine, that, that gain. Let's, let's pull out the plates and pass them around. And tomorrow shall be as today. In other words, much more abundant. You know why? We're going to be richer then. And tomorrow we'll put out even more trays of silver plates and pass them around. Verse 57. Excuse me, Isaiah 57, verse 1. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth at the heart. Now, there's a colon there, which means we're going to have a change of thought here. In other words, why are the righteous perishing? Well, with churches like we're just speaking about, is it any wonder? And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. In other words, God has his ways to protect the righteous. If you're one of God's chosen, or if you have asked our Father for truth, he will give it to you. He will protect you from what is to come. In a world where the righteous perish. Verse 2. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Verse 3. But draw near hither, ye sons of sorceresses, or sorceress, excuse me, ye sons of the sorceress, uh, sorceress, naturally, a sorceress such as Mystery Babylon. The seed of the adulterer and the whore. Now, we know who the ultimate adulterer is, right? I mean, Adam and Eve were made for each other, and he came in and committed adultery. And we know who the whore is, the whore of Babylon, spoken all through the book of Revelation. Verse 4. Against whom do ye you sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth? In other words, who, who are you uh, running your mouth at? Opening your big mouth. And draw out the tongue. Are ye not children of transgression? A seed of falsehood? In other words, they're not the true seed. They're the false seed. Verse 5. Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rock. Do you know who it was that made themselves strong in the cliffs of the rock? Maybe you were to look that verse up. I'll give you a hint by number. It's H7017, H7014 of 7013 with an affinity for 7069 in the Hebrew. Verse 6. Among the, among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They, they are thy lot. Even unto them thou hast poured a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? Now, what's being said here? Among the smooth stones of a stream. You, you, you know what a stone in a stream does? It gets worn down over time by the water. They are thy lot. They're worn down. But even unto them, unto the false rocks, thou hast poured out a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering. And God says, should I receive comfort in these? Verse 7. Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. You know, the high places of worship where they went up and worshipped Baal. And Chemosh. Verse 8. Behind the doors also, and the posts, hast thou set up thy remembrance. For thou hast discovered thyself to another other than me. Now, could that be any plain to you? Could that be made any plainer to you? Behind the doors. In other words, behind closed doors, and the posts, Thou hast set up thy remembrance, for thou 
has discovered thyself. In other words, you revealed yourself. You you've laid and committed whoredom with another other than me. You know, Christ is our husbandman. And art gone up and has enlarged thy bed. In other words, you have many lovers and made thee a covenant with them. In other words, they rejected God's covenant, made a covenant with others which are not even God. Thou lovest their bed where thou sawest it. In other words, as Eve looked upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was the serpent, and said, Ooh, yeah, baby, that's some good stuff. i got to have me some of that. Um, that's the analogy being given here. They have enlarged their bed to, to, to fit many lovers. You remember Jerusalem during this time was synonymous for having a god on every street. And even in Rome at Mars Hill, you know, Paul went up there and he says, I perceive that in all things you're too religious. I mean, they even had a God, to, they even had an altar to the unknown God. Verse 9. And thou wentest to the king, lowercase king, with ointment. It did increase thy perfumes and did send thy messengers afar off. And didst debase thyself even unto hell. In other words, it was to their, their, their own detriment. Debased themselves even unto hell. You do, people tend to do that when they turn their back on God. Verse 10. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. In other words, you are worn out from the greatness of your wonderful human flesh life. Yet thou saidest not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the life of thine hand. Therefore, thou hast not grieved. In other words, whatever you set your hand to happened for you, and it pleasured you, therefore you were not grieved. In other words, they didn't do anything for God. It was all about them. Therefore, they were not grieved because it pleased them. This is the bad thing about the world that we live in, and especially here in the United States. When times are too good, people forget God, and when they forget God, bad things start to happen. People start to creep in and start changing your laws and tightening the noose around your neck. And then they cast God away from you. Which is what's going on now. You know, I remember years ago listening to the dearly departed Pastor Murray and he always said, America will never be a socialist nation. We'll never be socialist. We'll never be communist. Well, we may never be communist. Not really sure about yet. The jury's still out. But I can tell you this, we're close. But we have been a socialist nation for some time. Because when one segment of the population goes out and works to feed and clothe and give cars and gifts and, and um, entitlements to another segment of the population, that's what you call socialism. When people can't speak the truth for being censored, that is socialism and bordering communism. When people can openly lie and make promises that they don't keep and are not called for by the media who are supposed to be their watchdogs, that's socialism. In other words, do you think the reporters in so the Soviet Union in the 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s would have dared to question the premier, they would have disappeared really quickly to some gulag and never been seen again. Do you think the people in China now can actually get up and ask questions that are truly need to be asked? No, they would disappear too. I mean, it's not a hard concept to grasp. Verse 11. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me or laid it to thy heart? Have not I held my peace even of old and thou fearest me not? In other words, God gave us the law. God set Israel upon a course. He gave them a kingdom, even a split kingdom for a time. And they were afraid of no one until they turned their back on God. But even so, God is saying, who are you afraid of or you feared that you lied? 
the answer is no one. They didn't have anyone to be afraid of. And it's not remembered me. In other words, we're still talking about idolatry here, false gods and such. Nor did you lay it to your heart. You didn't even consider it. You didn't think about it. And God said, Have not I held my peace even of old? And thou fearest not me? In other words, God said, I'll let you have your way. I'll let you do pretty much as you pleased and blessed you. And yet you do not revere me. Verse 12. I will declare thy righteousness and thy works, for they shall not profit thee. Do you really think that these kinds of things, building false gods, false doctrines, are going to profit anyone? Or the kind of works that they do where they get rich? We're not talking strictly here of the religious. I mean, anybody on the earth passing through this earth age. Everybody's going to stand in front of judgment before the throne of God. Verse 13. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee. In other words, the ones you kept company with, your lovers that were in your bed. But the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity, which is to say emptiness, shall take them. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. Now, how can you inherit God's holy mountain if you're not here? I mean, that's God's favorite place on the earth. Israel, Jerusalem. How can you inherit that if you're not here, if you're raptured away? Verse 14. And shall say, in other words, those that uh, inherit his land, cast ye up, cast ye up. Prepare the way. Take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. In other words, cast ye up. Get them stones out of the road. Clear the way. Get the stumbling blocks out of the road of his people. The day of correction. The day of the Lord. Verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. In other words, that would be our Father. Whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. To revive a, the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. In other words, God dwells on high with him that is of a contrite spirit. You could even say this was Yahshua. To revive the spirit of the humble. That is to say the meek. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Those that reverence God. Those that care about God. Verse 16. For I will not contend forever. Now, God's not always going to strive with mankind or with Satan or any of them. Neither will I always be wroth. In other words, God's not always going to be mad. He's going to do uh, what has to be done. And that's going to be the end of it. For the Spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. In other words, if God was angry all the time, his own spirit should fail him. And the spirit of truth, and the souls which he's made, they should all fail. Verse 17. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and smote him. I hid me, and was wroth, and he won forwardly in the way of his heart. Now again, you could look at this as Satan. You could look at it as uh, Israel. That is to say, sinful Israel. God does not like iniquity. And he especially does not like covetousness. That is to say, covet things which are not of God. And God was wroth, and God smote him. In other words, God corrected him. And then God hid himself and was angered. And he, that is to say the sinful one, went on forwardly in the way of his heart. Not in the way of God's heart. Verse 18. I have seen his ways, and will heal him, and will lead him also, and restore comforts unto him, and to his mourners. 
In other words, that's what our Father is willing to do. But it is conditional upon the reverence and love of God through Jesus Christ. Verse 19. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace. Peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near, saith the Lord. And I will heal him. Verse 20. But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt, which is to say filth. You know, go back and look at the Japanese tsunamis. You know, look at, remember how dirty and black that water was? Verse 21. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. In other words, there's not going to be any peace for the wicked. They're not going to live forever. They're not going to inherit eternity. They're not going to have peace of mind. All they're going to have is what they have in this earth age. And if they don't come around in the millennium, then they're gone. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Now, we're going to be talking here about the Gentiles again. I, you know, I don't even know how this particularly came up. In this thing, maybe it's just necessary. Maybe it's what our Father wanted. I'm choosing things here where eyes are closed and people have gone their own way, but here we go with, with God talking about the Gentiles here. Uh, Romans chapter 11 and verse 1. This will be Paul speaking, naturally. I say then, hath God cast away his people? That is to say, Israel? God forbid that no. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, he was considered a Jew, but Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin and he was also half Roman. Verse 2. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew, that is to say, in the world it was. What not ye what the scripture saith of Elias? That is to say, Elias. In other words, what not means, don't you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, verse 3, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Verse 4, But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved unto myself seven thousand men which have not bowed a knee to the image of Baal. Baal, as you know, symbolic of the Antichrist. Baal, most certainly a false god in the old days. But God reserved to himself 7,000 men. Okay? Uh, largely, we're talking about the very elect here. Um, is their number exactly 7,000? That's anybody's guess. Seven, no matter in what denomination you look at it in the Bible, having to do with spiritual completeness. Verse 5. Even so, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Okay, God made a remnant of elect that would always be here to teach the truth. Verse 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more of grace. But if it be by works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, there is no more work. In other words, you do need works in this earth age, okay? I mean, I think we've established that in many other chapters. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's not contradicting that. He's saying that it is by grace that God, not by works. In other words, it's not by the works that these people did. I can tell you right now that this... Uh, 55 year old man speaking to you now was not in a great position in life when God called up to me so it certainly was not my works that earned me uh, the wisdom and knowledge that God gave me uh, eventually I mean my will was to drive fast cars and to uh, go out and get into trouble to do things I shouldn't have done but God dealt with me so that's, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Grace is unmerited favor. 
In other words, God is willing to show unmerited favor to anyone that will. Verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for? For the election have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. In other words, not everyone that's an Israelite is one of God's elect. Were you aware of that? I mean, they may have overcome in the world that was, but that doesn't guarantee they're going to be one of God's election. I mean, there are many examples I could point to. I mean, Nadab, Abihu, um, Kohath, the Kohathites, that is to say, Dathan, Abiram, many of the kings of Israel, even David and Solomon, who were pretty large sinners earlier in their lives, Absalom, you know, a lot of people. Verse 8. According to it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, unto this day. You know, there's always going to be people, even those of Israel, I'm sorry to say, that God can put the spirit of slumber or stupor upon. Now, the election have obtained it. They earned it. But even some of the Israelites slip and fall. But we're not talking about just Israelites here exclusively. God hath given the spirit of slumber upon many eyes, that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. This is one reason why Christ spoke in parables. He didn't want them understanding. Not time for it yet. Many are going to be saved in the millennium. Probably here they can't be saved. God knows what it's like to walk in the flesh. He did it himself. Verse 9. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. <laughs> Again, David hated that. He hated iniquity. Verse 10. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see. And bow down their back always. In other words, let them be abased. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now naturally that's not the only purpose. It is to provoke Israel to jealousy when they see the Gentiles doing better than they uh, are and receiving better blessings than they receive. But you know, liberals practice the same thing, that is to say progressives and uh, those that pander, they love to pander to the Gentiles. They love to pander to the perceived minority. But what is he saying here in verse 11? Has Israel stumbled that they should fall? Uh, no. God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. In other words, Israel fell, and the Gentiles saw it and learned from it. And they learned to reverence God. For to provoke them to jealousy. To provoke Israel to jealousy. You need to read Deuteronomy chapter 28. All the way through to 32. Verse 12. Now if the fall of them. Be the riches of the world. And the diminishing them. Be the, be the riches of the Gentiles. How much more their fullness. In other words. The Israelites that craved the riches of the world, that caused them to fall. Why? Satan fell in pride because of his riches. But the diminishing of them was the riches of the Gentiles. We're to talking about two different types of riches here. One is of the world, one is of God. That's the riches of the Gentile. So how much more their fullness? In other words, God's plan and action. How much more is their fullness? Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Now, this is not saying, Paul's not saying I'm magnifying myself. 
He said, I'm doing the best I can with the office God has given me. I am magnifying it. I'm making it greater. I'm making it bigger. Verse 14. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, that is to say fellow Israelites, and might save some of them. Now naturally at this time, there were those that were Kenites that called themselves Jews, and they probably were not known about by everyone. But they were thought of as Jews amongst the entire world. Verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall they receive of them but life from the dead? In other words, if them being cast away corrects them, reconciling of the world, in other words, the world has a way of correcting. The world is a very harsh place, and it doesn't take you very long to understand how, just how harsh the world can be. And, and what shall, receive, shall they receive in their correction but life from the dead? In other words, they're going to get life from lifelessness. In other words, they're going to return to God, return to Christ. Verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. The lump, of course, being the, uh, the whole load. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, we're speaking of Israel here metaphorically, broken off, they fell and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, that is to say, the Gentiles, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Verse 18. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. In other words, boast not against the other branches. There are a lot of people right now that in their pride of becoming Christians will boast themselves. I mean, th this is a kind of hard one to explain. There are people in Israel right now who are of true Judah. There are people in Israel who are not of true Judah. And I speak not only of the uh, Kenites, but also those that converted to Judaism, or what we call now the, the belief of Zionism. But does it do any good to boast against them? No, we don't boast against them, we try to correct them. Because if you, if you boast, you, you're not bearing the root. The root is supposed to be holy, but the root is going to bear you. In other words, it's going to turn out a, a, a way that you don't want it to. Verse 19. Thou will say again, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Verse 20. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. That is to say reverence. In other words, don't be haughty because you have been grafted in. And really that's what the, the verse above that I was trying to get out has to do with. Don't be high-minded. Don't be lofty. Verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee. In other words, if God won't spare Israel and uh, can cause them to fall, don't, don't think he won't make you fall if you get haughty. Haughtiness causes a lot of people's fall. And haughtiness is brought on by the wiles of the flesh and of the world. Verse 22. Behold therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. In other words, don't ever boast yourself if you're a Christian that understands the truth. Don't think of yourself as higher than the people around you that, that don't know the truth. Your job is to save them, not to make fun of them. Not to act as though you're something above them. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, 
They shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. In other words, God is able to restore that which was broken. Verse 24. For if thou were cut out of an olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? That is to say, if they return to God. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, that is to say, this thing that is hard to understand, lest ye otherwise be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words, part of the blinding of Israel has to do with bringing in the Gentile. Why? Because the Israelites, uh, especially of this time, hated the Gentiles and had nothing to do with the Gentiles. They even railed against Christ when he sat and ate with publicans and senators, or excuse me, well, sinners, you know, senator, sinner, pretty much the same thing. I'm kidding. Verse 26. Well, I'm not kidding so much, but I'm still kidding. Verse 26. So all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion, which is Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. In other words, all Israel is going to be saved. Does this mean they cannot lose their salvation if they follow their own will? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But all that will shall be saved. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. You know why I say this? Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm probably going to get some questions about this or some comments that are probably going to read like, Hey, you, you just said that all Israel is not going to be saved and the Bible clearly tells us it does. Well, what about the unforgivable sin? I mean, probably that will never be committed, but what if it is? You think they're going to be saved then? That's why I say this. I always leave the door open. You know, it, Israel is, God to, is God's to do with so ever he will. If he decides to save every one of them, no matter how bad a sinner they are, that's his business. But God being fair and just has certain measures that he lives by. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins, verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Now, as concerning the gospel, which is the good news, they are enemies for your sakes. Who are we talking about here? Israel, that fell away to their sins. But as touching the election... They are beloved for the Father's sakes. And naturally we're talking about uh, our Heavenly Father, even though this is lowercase, but also their Father's sakes. In other words, the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and so on and so forth. Verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God's not sorry about it. He has no reason to be. They are gifts. As when you give someone a gift, you're not sorry that you bought them something. You have no repentance for it. I mean, there's probably times some should be because they gave people gifts that they hurt themselves with or what have you, but that's neither here nor there as concerning this. Verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now he obtained mercy through their unbelief. Why? Because the Gentiles believed in God and they did it better in many cases than Israel did. Verse 31. Even so, these also now, uh, e even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. In other words, when the Israelites see the Gentiles believing, it's kind of like the parable of the prodigal son. You know, he went away from his father and he was out working and uh, having to eat pig slop and he got to remember at home and he thought, you know what, my father's servants 
are eating better than I'm eating. So he returned. It wasn't necessarily out of jealousy, but out of good common sense. My father's servants, which no doubt were Gentiles, are eating better than I'm eating. So that's the lesson being given here. Israel, through seeing the Gentiles excel, and who are the Gentiles? The Kenites, and, and many others that have come to Christ. Verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Verse 33. All the depth of riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. In other words, we can never understand the love and the glory and the wisdom and the plan of God. I mean, it does make people jealous and it even makes people turn away from God in anger. But they'll turn back if they have good sense. Verse 34. For who, knew, who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Uh, answer, no one. I mean, th there are a couple occasions where someone said to God, you know, you shouldn't do this because the Gentiles are going to see it and they're going to say, ah, God brought his children out here in the desert to kill them off. Naturally, I'm talking about Moses. But um, you think that wasn't put upon Moses by the Holy Spirit to say that? That Moses just thought that himself? You know, our father works in strange ways. The important thing to learn from this is that God has set the spirit of slumber upon some. Not just Israel, but also many in the world today who do not even know they're Israel, first of all, but also of the Gentiles. Verse 35. For who hath first given him, or given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Let's start at, uh, let's start back at 33 and make this uh, understanding count. All the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Verse 34. For hath, who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsel? Verse 35. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? The answer again is no one. Verse 36. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. And in other words, we are talking about God Almighty, Omnipotent, who gave us of Himself by coming here in the flesh, partaking of this nasty flesh, being crucified for everyone's sins, taking upon Himself the sins of the world, and giving us eternal life, that the blinded may see. You know, don't be envious of those that are worldly right now. Don't be envious of what you see going on in the world. And don't be dismayed when you see the ignorance and stupidity of people around you. And how easily they are duped. Because we are in confusion. We are going into Babylon. And we are going there uh, with a blower and nitrous oxide pushing the engine of the vehicle we're in. Okay? And that's just the way it is. So, that being said, I hope you have gained something from this study. As always, I could go on and on. I, I could make probably each one of these lectures five hours long if I had the time to sit here for five hours and go through many, many more chapters and verses. But, you know, personal study is the best thing that's going to help you. You know, not just the things I say. Don't just trust me because I say a thing. Go and check me out. See if it makes sense to you. But, stay in your Father's Word every day. If you can. Certainly every week. Use the tools that God gave us to study with to search out His Word. 
the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, the E.W. Bulliger Companion Bible, the Septuagint, the Masoretic Texts. First and foremost, though, pray to our Father for guidance and wisdom and understanding when you study His Most Holy Word. And brothers and sisters, don't be lofty. Pray for those that have no eyes to see, that they may see, or that they may see at the appropriate time, even if that's the millennium, that they may not die, but live forever with us and enjoy all eternity. And until we see you again, thank you for listening. May God bless you. This has been Just Thoughts.